Uh oh, sorry. Okay. All right. We'll uh, we'll begin. It is uh, it's week six and uh, it's Monday, and so uh, a new week begins. Uh, I hope I hope you guys are all doing okay. Um, yeah, it's been uh, it's been a long uh, it's been a long quarter, and we're uh, we're uh, we're getting through it, I guess. Um, I uh, appreciate everybody who responded to the um, kind of mid quarter uh, feedback uh, questionnaire, and um, yeah, I, I see. Uh, how you guys are doing. I uh, appreciate you uh, sharing with that. And um, yeah, I'm taking um, a lot of what you have to say into consideration. So um, yeah, it's a, it, it's a tough quarter for everyone. Um, well, uh, we'll, uh, we'll continue um, on in um, kind of our, our lessons and stuff. And, uh, and the topic for today is going to be the uh, the Bayes classifier. Okay, so we're gonna um, introduce the topic of classification. This is a an important aspect, um, especially as in um, in machine learning and uh, and whatnot. In the textbook, uh, we are jumping to chapter five in the textbook. Um, chapters three and four take um, uh, a Bayesian approach to um, modeling and um, and I uh, we're not going to cover Bayesian uh, statistics in this course. Um, I cover that in my 102c class but um, but not um, not this class okay um, And today's lesson is on the Bayes classifier but that's not that's not Bayesian statistics that's an application of Bayes rules so all right um, okay the uh, the idea as far as classification goes, is that you have um, your input data, okay? You've got n observations, uh, and they're labeled uh, x sub one through x sub n, okay? X each containing some kind of uh, in d-dimensional space, okay? And, uh, and each object is associated with some class label. So it might be, uh, so the, there are a total of c classes, and so t sub n could be, um, come from uh, the elements one, one through C, okay? And the goal is to predict um, the class of a new object, okay? So if you think of your, um, your iris data set, okay, you have, um, you have your training data, and, and in the training part, they're each labeled with, you know, Setosa or Virginica or Versicolor. And so you have three classes, and um, and each each um, observation has you know um, four values in their x vector, right? Petal length and petal width and sepal length and sepal width. Um, and then the goal is that um, after you finish training, you'll get a new observation, and you'll be able to um, predict uh, the class label, whether it's Setosa, Virginica, or whatever it might be, right? Okay, and um, in this, uh, in the classification, we store the class labels as integers, but we, we have to treat them as categories, right? Um, when, when something's class label two, it's not twice as big as class label one, and you can't have something like a class label 2.5. It's either class label one, two, or three, okay? Um, what we're going to learn today is the, uh, the Bayes classifier, which uses Bayes rule. And, uh, and it's a probabilistic classifier, all right? And so the, uh, the number that it returns will be a probability that an observation belongs to a particular class, okay? Um, another example of a probabilistic classifier is logistic regression. Uh, and then we'll also later learn non-probabilistic um, classifiers such as the k-nearest neighbors and the support vector machine, okay? Uh, and again, this is not Bayesian statistics. It is the, um, it's just an application of Bayes rule. 
All right, so just to review uh, your probability rules from 100A, okay? The uh, Bayes theorem says that the probability of A given B is equal to the probability of B given A times the probability of A, which is exactly equal to uh, the probability of B intersection A or B and A. So B given A times the probability of A is the probability of A and B, okay? And then uh, you take that, and then you divide by the probability of B. So your denominator is the probability of B, okay? And, um, and also by the law of total probability, the denominator probability of B can be de decomposed into the probability of B given A sub N times the probability of A sub N for all possible values of N, right? So, so um, the denominator is equal to the numerator Okay, if you sum it across all possible values of A, right? So often the case, uh, you'll, you'll do it for B given A times the probability of A um, plus the probability of B given A complement times the probability of A complement. Or, um, you know, in, in this case, if A is a class label, you'll do it for each, each possible class. Okay, and, uh, and so keep in mind our goal is that we want to know the probability of the new class label, okay? The probability that the class label is equal to some particular class, okay? For a uh, a new observation x, okay? Um, or given given our new observation values, okay? And then all of the training data. So this would be something like, what's the probability that this new flower that we're observing belongs to class uh, versicolor? given that its petal length is, you know, 12.3 and petal width is 8.7 and sepal length is, you know, two, whatever it is, okay? Uh, and, and all of the other training data, right? So um, the values in the input vector are gonna be um, the, the values in the observations, okay? The new observation. And then, um, and then you have all of the training data and all of the training labels, okay? All right, so because the Bayes classifier returns a probability, there's a, it obeys just rules of probability, okay? Um, in that the probability that it belongs to a certain class is gonna be between zero and one. And then <clears throat> the sum of the probabilities will add up to one if you consider all possible classes. So if there's three possible classes, the model might say um, the observation belongs to class A with probability 0.19. It belongs to class B with probability 0.8 and probability of class, uh, class C with probability 0.01, right? And if you add those three numbers up, they add up to one. All right. Um, so far, so good. Uh, if, if everything's good, you can go ahead and give me a, a little green uh, check, check mark here. Um, right now, I'm just kind of going over Bayes rule and probability stuff. Okay, all right. So then um, on this slide, we are just going to, okay, yeah, thank, great. Uh, looks like most of you are doing fine. On this slide, we're gonna look at the, um, apply Bayes rule to um, kind of this classifier, right? So Bayes rule is A given B is B given A times the probability divided by probability B, okay? So here I've got, T nu give equals C given X nu. Um, that's gonna be kind of my A and the B. And I'm basically gonna swap these, okay? I've got uh, probability of X nu given T nu equals C times the probability that T nu equals C divided by the probability of X nu. Um, X comma T is gonna be um, kind of given in, uh, in all of these things so that it, it minimally affects it, okay? Um, okay. So this is the probability that we want to find. This, this we call the posterior. The posterior, this part, is the posterior is the probability that we want to find, okay? This, this part right here, okay, the probability of x nu given t nu equals c, all right? Let's think about what that means. It's the probability, we call this the likelihood, okay? This is the likelihood, it's the likelihood. Um, it's the probability of observing the observed values in X nu, okay? It's the probability of getting these particular values in X nu 
if if we assume that this new observation did belong to class C, right? So if we assumed that the flower came from Setosa, okay, what's the probability that it would have a petal length of, you know, 8.7? I'm, I'm making these numbers up. I don't remember what the numbers are, okay? Um, the prior, this is the probability of T nu equals to C. This is the probability that some new observation belongs to class C before we know anything else about it. And then the bottom, this is called the marginal. And it's the probability of observing the values in X nu regardless of the class label, okay? And, uh, and all of those things are calculated, the, you calculate those probabilities based on your training data, okay? So that's why the X comma T shows up in, in all of these parts. All right, um, so we're gonna take the um, total law of total probability, and um, and what what this allows us to do is that um, we can take advantage of the fact that the um, the probabilities across all possible classes have to sum to one. Okay, and so that means the denominator must equal to the must be equal to the sum of the numerator across all possible classes, okay? So, so this is what I, um, what we had on the previous slide, okay? And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna expand this probability of x nu given uh, x comma t. So it's really just the probability of x nu. We are going to expand that to be the sum of the numerator across all possible classes, right? So this is where we're taking the law of total probability. And so, you know, just like, on uh, on this slide, we expanded the probability of B to the probability of B given A uh, times the probability of A across all possible values of A. We're going to do the same thing here, but we're going to do it across all possible values of T nu equals to C prime. So it's going to be from C prime equals one all the way up to class C, and we're going to we're going to do it there. Okay. All right. Um, I guess before I start the example, I just want to confirm one more time that uh, that everything is is okay, especially this slide um, where I've got the different parts. This I call the posterior. This we're going to call the likelihood. This is the prior, and this is the marginal. And uh, and just give me another green check mark if uh, if this is all okay, or if you have any questions on this slide, um, go ahead and ask or, uh, or raise your hand or something. Okay, someone uh, requested a little bit of go slower. So uh, I don't know if you had uh, any particular question here. Um, the, uh, again, what I'm trying to do here is um, we've got A given B and the given part, the B, this part is, these are the values that we've observed in our new observation. Okay, and then the probability of A is the probability that an observation belongs to a particular class, okay? And that's what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to figure out that an observation belongs to a particular class given the, um, the values here. So, you know, what we're trying to do is if, if we come in with these four flat flower measurements, right? We have a new flower, new iris, um, comes in with these four measurements, that's going to be the x nu. So given these four measurements, you know, petal length, petal width, sepal length, sepal width, you know, what's the probability that this observation is class setosa? What's the probability that it's class virginica? What's the probability it's class versicolor? Um, that's, that's what these things are, okay? And then, uh, and then we, we're going to flip this around into these different, uh, uh, different components here. Okay, so I'm gonna do a silly example, all right? And so, I don't know, you go online and you order a whole bunch of pouches and they're all, and these pouches are filled with red and blue marbles, okay? And, uh, and you decide to order 25 of them some, from some arbitrary company, okay? And then, uh, and then when, you, when they arrive, 
okay? You see that the pouches are filled at three different factories, okay? And each of these factories seem to operate a little bit differently, okay? And so um, out of the 25, 24 of them are labeled with their factory, and then the last one is not, okay? This is a completely contrived example, okay? But we're gonna say half of them, okay? 12 out of the 24 come from factory A. Uh, a one fourth of them come from factory B, okay? Six uh, come from factory B, and six come from factory C, okay? The last one's not labeled, so we're gonna try to guess. And then we're, we're gonna assume that when you, they fill the bags, they're filled with some kind of Bernoulli or binomial random process, okay? So I've got 25 bags here, 24 of them are labeled and that's gonna be our training data. And then we've got one unlabeled case, that's gonna be our test, test data, okay? And then so what we've done is we've gone through and we've, compiled all of the training data, right? So we take, we take the, uh, there's 12 bags in, from factory A, okay? And then we count how many, you know, the total proportion that are red and blue in the factory A bags. And what we find is that 60% of the marbles that we observe come from factory A, okay? I mean, uh, it's not 60%. For, for the marbles that came from factory A, 60% of them are red, okay? And then for the marbles that come from factory B, half of them are red, 50% are red. And then for the six pouches that came from factory C, 40% of them are red, okay? So this is going to be, uh, we're gonna summarize our, our training data this way, all right? And, um, and it's important that this is just based on the observed data, okay? We don't actually work at the factories and we don't know the exact filling proportions, all right? So, um, you know, the, the pouches that arrive, they, they exhibit, exhibit variation, but, um, but not so much we're, that we're, we feel okay continuing to assume that it's a binomial process, okay? And then, um, and what we're gonna do is using kind of these summary stats, we're gonna use the maximum likelihood estimates of fill, the filling proportions Okay, based on the training data that we have. So uh, luckily for us, or just for the binomial case, or in Bernoulli case, the maximum likelihood estimate is just your observed proportion, right? So if, if you observe 60% to be red, then your MLE is gonna just be 0.6. Okay, so you take our test case, the 25th one, okay, and then you open the bag, there's 20 marbles in of them inside, and 10 of them are red. Okay, your sorry, this should be p hat. Your observed proportion is 0 0.5. Okay, and so now we want to know which factory produced this bag. Okay, which which factory produced this bag? So here is um, this is what we want to know. Okay, or this is this is how we're going to compute it. Right, we're going to calculate the likelihood. Okay which is what is the likelihood of getting our data? In our case, 10 marbles out of 20 that are red, okay? Given, okay, the likelihood is the probability of getting your observed data X, given that it belongs to some particular class, right? It's the probability of observing the observed data if you assumed it can't belong to a specific class. And so the binomial probabilities um, is just N choose X, P raised to the X, one minus p raised to the n minus x, okay? And so if it came from factory A, factory A, according to our data, is 60% red, okay? So our MLE estimate for p is gonna be 0.6. So if it comes from factory A, the likelihood of getting 10 red out of 20 marbles is gonna be 20 choose 10, 0.6 to the 10, 0.4 to the 10, and that turns out to be around 0 0.117, okay? Um, the likelihood, that it comes from the likelihood of our data, that is, again, 20 choose 10, um, 10 marbles are read out of the 20 marbles total, if it comes from factory B, okay, mm. is gonna be equal to uh, 0.176, all right? And the way we got this is because um, the, uh, 
the probability that we observed the the our probability estimate of p hat is 0 0.5 okay so we've got um, 20 choose 10 0.5 to the 10 0.5 to the 10 here and we get 0 0.176 uh, and then lastly, for probability C, we have 20 choose 10.4 to the 10 and 0.6 to the 10, okay? Um, which coincidentally is equal to factor A, just because there's, um, we got an equal number here, right? All right, is everyone okay with um, these likelihood numbers, just applying the binomial and then the fact, uh, and where I got these 0 0.6, 0 0.5, and 0 0.4 numbers? So 0 0.6, 0 0.5, and 0 0.4 come from, the observed data, okay, where we had all of these different um, pouches and we counted the uh, the proportions that we observed, and then the entire thing here. This these are just the binomial probabilities. We're applying the uh, the likelihood function to that. Okay, so these are what we call the likelihoods. Okay, the prior probabilities. The prior probabilities are. Um, the um, is the probability that the new observation belongs to class C um, before knowing anything else about it, okay? So prior to opening the 25th bag, um, what is the probability that it came from a particular factory? That's kind of the idea behind the prior, right? So based on our training data, okay, um, because half of the bags, right, so, um, in our training data, we had 24 bags, and 12 of them, half of them came from factory A, our prior probability for factory A is gonna be 0.5, okay? And then um, six out of the 24, one fourth of the bags came from factory B, so we're gonna say, um, we're gonna assume that one, um, there's a one fourth probability that the bag comes from factory B, and because in our training data, one fourth came from factory C, we're going to assume that this this bag has a probability of 0.25 of coming from factory C. So that's going to be our prior probability. Okay, so we have our likelihood numbers which come from the binomial and our estimated values of the proportions for each class. And then our prior probabilities are just based on the observed proportions in our training data. In our training data, 12 out of the 24 bags came from factory A six out of the 24 came from factory B and six out of the 24 came from factory C. So we're just gonna assume these proportions are kind of representative of the population and therefore we have these probabilities here. Okay, so those are, that's the likelihood and the priors. Okay, why don't I um, give you the first quiz answer and then um, if you have any questions so far or, uh, or feedback, uh, let, let me know. Uh, so our first quiz answer is B, B as in boy. I've got to, uh, I still have to actually construct the, the quiz thing on CCLE. So just give me a, a moment to do that after class ends. Um, but uh, the first quiz answer is gonna be B. Okay, so that is the likelihood and the priors. Okay, so the, uh, the bottom part is the marginal probability, okay? And uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna calculate the numerator for all possible classes and then we're gonna end up adding them up, okay? So, so the numerator is the likelihood times the prior, okay? So the likelihood is what's the probability of getting our data if it came from a particular class and then uh, times the prior probability. So for class A, it's the likelihood of observing 10 red if the bag came from factory A where 60% are red, multiplied by the probability that a random bag comes from class A, which is, so we're gonna take the, this is the binomial probability, and we're gonna multiply it by the um, probability 0.5. Here's the binomial probability for class B, observing 10 red if it came from factory B where half of them are red, okay? Um, and the prior probability is 0.25, okay? And then class C is this multiplied by this. Okay, and so um, the denominator, okay, 
is going to be the sum of the uh, numerator uh, across all possible classes. So I'm going to take these numbers, which is the numerator values, 0 0.058, 0 0.044, 0 0.0292. Okay, and I'm going to add them up right here. Okay, and this is just applying the law of total probability in that the probability of getting 10 red out of 20 marbles across any possible class value is uh, is going to be equal to the probability of getting 10 red for if it came from class A, 10 red if it came from class B, and the 10 red if it came from class C. And so we just add those up, and this is what we get for the marginal probability, which is goes into the denominator. Okay. And really, the denominator is just uh, basically a scaling factor so that everything adds up to one, okay? All right, so if I plug in all the numbers that I have, okay, so this is, this is the numerator, 0 0.0585. 0585 is the numerator for class A. And, uh, and so this is, uh, I just apply this. So the probability, uh, the probability that belongs to class A, given our data, that is 10 red out of 20 uh, marbles are red, uh, and our training data, okay? This is gonna equal the probability of getting 10 red if class A has a probability of 0.6, multiplied by factory A, which has probability 0.12 out of 24, divided by the probability of getting 10 red regardless of factory, all right? So this is the binomial probability times 1 half, divided by the sum of the numerators across all classes, and we get something around 0 0.444. And if I apply this for class B and class C, then I get 0 0.334 for class B and 0 0.222 for class C, okay? Okay, so uh, around 44% come from class A. Probability of 0.44, that it comes from class A, probability of 0.33 that it comes from class B, and probability of 0.22 if, that it comes from class C. Okay, and so just, just to keep in mind, um, our test case is 50% red, all right? And so if our calculation classification was based only on this, we would um, pick factory B because in the training data, the proportion of red marbles from factory B is 50%, while factory A had a proportion of 60% and factory C had an estimated proportion of 40%. And so the fact that our, our sample is 50% red would mean like factory B would probably be our choice, okay? But with the Bayes classifier, we also take into account the, the prior probabilities, okay? And specifically that means we say, you know, uh, the other aspect in our data is that half of the bags come from A whereas only one fourth of the bags come from factory B. So if we didn't look at the data, okay, if we didn't know that the bag was 50% red, if we didn't know that, then prior to looking at the bag, we would have guessed factory A because factory A, half of the bags come from factory A, whereas only a quarter of the bags come from factory B, okay? And so when you look at the data though, and you combine it with the prior probabilities, that kind of adjusts, adjusts it. Um, a little bit where um, factory A is, um, has an overall probability of 0.44, okay? So it's not quite as high as 0 0.5, it's not as high as the prior probabilities, okay? Um, and factory B, which prior to looking at anything, has a probability of 0.25, one, one out of four, you know, that gets bumped up to around 0.33, okay? And then factory C, which had a prior probability of 0.25, that ends up going down uh, even lower to 0.22, considering that our data is only 50% is 50 red, okay? Um, so after you combine the likelihood and the priors, factory A ends up being the most probable class. Let me just show how this changes up. Oh, here, uh, let me talk about the assumptions we've made, okay? Um, there's there's a few major assumptions, right? So um, a couple of the major assumptions was that um, after we tally up the data in our training cases, we assume that our maximum likelihood estimates, okay, we said uh, in our training data, 
of the bags, uh, you know, for the bags that came from factory A, 60% were red. Therefore, we're assuming factory A is 60% red. And we said for the bags that came from factory B, 50% were red. And therefore, we're assuming that factory B is 50% red, okay? Um, technically, we can relax that as uh, assumption and we can say, you know, factory A could be 60% red, but it could also be other values. And factory B could be 50% red, but it could also be other values and stuff like that. Um, that would require a fully Bayesian approach, um, but that's gonna be beyond the scope of our class, okay? And then the other big assumption was that in our training data, 12 out of the 24 bags came from factory A. Because of that, we assume that this new bag, which was unlabeled, prior to looking at the contents, um, we said it, it has a 50% probability of coming from factory A, okay? And so the assumption there is that we assume our sample's representative of the class proportions in the population, which may or may not be a good assumption, okay? Um, and so here I said, uh, you know, someone else can make different assumptions. Maybe they have knowledge of the manufacturing process, and they know that all three factories produce equal quantities of bags, and therefore they would say that the probability that a random bag comes from factory A is just one third, okay? That we don't, we can ignore that the fact that, you know, in our sample, half of them came from factory A, okay? They can just say, well, that's just a coincidence of your data, okay? And so again, the, you know, the situation in your domain knowledge will affect how you model your prior probabilities. Okay, let's say, um, let's say we change it up, okay, and we get a different test case, all right? And in this test case, we have 20 marbles and only six of them are red. Only six of them are red, okay? So, um, you know, if it comes from factory A, the likelihood of getting only six red is quite low because factory A, 60% are red. And so that, you know, in our observation, six out of 20, so that's only 30% red. So what's the probability of getting only six out of 20 red if factory A's proportion is 0.6, okay? So then that would be 20 to six, 0.6 to the 6, 0.4 to the 14, right? And then we multiply that by the prior probability of 0 0.5, okay? And then we, here's the, uh, the likelihood for factory B. We use 0 0.4 to the 6, point, I'm sorry, 0 0.5 to the 6, 0 0.5 to the 14, multiplied by the prior probability 0.25. And then factory C, which um, according to our training data is only 40% red, okay? So factory C is the one that's most similar to our observed data, okay? Our observed data is only 30% red. So factory C is the closest one. So that's gonna be 0.4 to the 6, 0.6 to the 14, okay? Uh, uh, okay, so, I, uh, so on the front previous slide, when I said, uh, when I say ignore, we leave one third out of the equation if they are all equal. Well. Um, you would include it, but they would all end up canceling each other out, okay? So I guess it's, um, um, so here, what we're ignoring is the fact that in our training data, half of them came from class A, okay? And here we're applying our specific prior, prior knowledge of the, or domain knowledge of the manufacturing process saying that we, we know that a third of them come from factory A. Um, okay, so here I combine the likelihood using the binomial probability um, with our prior probabilities, okay? Our prior probabilities here remain the same of 0 0.5, 0 0.25, and 0 0.25, okay? And again, we could change these depending on the situation. The, the prior probabilities here, they're based on the fact that 12 came from A, 6 came from B, and 6 came from C, okay? So, um, so I take these numbers and I add them up and I get an overall probability of 0.0427. That's the total probability. That's the sum of the numerators across all possible classes. And then we divide these out, okay? And then when I do that, um, prob class C has the highest probability of 0.727 and class A has the lowest probability of 0.056, okay? 
and and that's because you know in our data we only had six red out of 20 okay which is going to be quite unlikely to happen if it comes from factory a where the class proportion has probability 0.6 okay and it's much more likely to happen if the class proportion uh, class c where the proportion is 0.4 red okay so the fact that we only got 30 percent red makes class c a lot more uh, uh, more probable candidate okay and, and so this just explains exactly what i said there all right i hope that's okay um slow me down or stop me if uh, if i've lost anybody along the way here um okay so that's um so that's that and what we're going to do is we're going to apply this to uh, a mixture of multivariate Gaussian, um, mixture of multivariate Gaussian um, uh, distributions. Okay, so um, this is the multivariate Gaussian or multivariate normal distribution. Okay, this is the uh, the PDF, and it looks kind of crazy and wonky, but it, if you look up the normal PDF. normal distribution, the, um, the PDF of the normal distribution is actually quite similar. Can I zoom into this? Okay, it's, it's quite similar to the multivariate PDF, right? It's here I've got one over square root two pi, and here it's one over two pi to the d over two. So if it's uh, D is one dimensional, it would be the square root of two pi, but it's uh, D dimensional. And then this is uh, the variance, uh, square root of the variance is sigma, and this is basically our variance matrix, sigma to the one half, and E raised to the negative one half, and then I've got X minus mu divided by sigma, and here I've got uh, quantity squared, and basically I've got, for the X minus mu quantity squared, I've got X minus mu transpose times X minus mu, and then there's no such thing as division, but I've got, I'm, it's multiplied by the uh, matrix inverse, okay, sigma inverse, uh, which is a square matrix that goes in the middle. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of similarities here, okay, between the um, normal PDF and the multivariate normal PDF, okay. Uh, and so what we have here is that x is going to be your d-dimensional vector. Uh, mu is going to be a vector of means of the population. It's the same size as x, okay, um, but inside uh, the mu vector, the dth element is the mean of x sub d, okay, and then um, sigma is the uh, d by d variance covariance matrix of all the x variables, right, okay. Um, one thing to note is that if sigma is um, a diagonal matrix, um, or if all the octagonal elements are zero, then the x variables are independent of each other, and this multivariate PDF can be factored into the product of univariate PDFs. Okay, and we'll cover this on Wednesday's lecture when we do the uh, naive Bayes classifier. Okay, but here we're just doing regular Bayes classifier. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, just simulate some data. All right, and um, and so I'm going to use library uh, multivariate norm, MVT norm, okay? And, uh, and here I'm going to specify what my, um, here we're going to generate three multivariate um, things, okay? So I'm going to have X is going to be two-dimensional, and I'm going to have a multivariate normal for class A, a multivariate normal for class B, and class C, okay? So my mu vector has length two, and then my sigma matrix is two by two. Okay, four elements. Uh, and so for uh, sigma A and sigma B, these are going to be diagonal matrices. All right. Um, sigma A has a variance of three for X1 and a variance of one for X2, whereas sigma B has a variance of one and one. So this is uh, the identity. Okay. And then the third class, uh, mu C, it's, um, it's got some covariances here. Okay. Uh, so again, if you think of your matrix being arranged that way, it's going to have some covariance. And then here you can generate random multivariate normal data by saying RMV norm, 
I want 30 data points, the mean is mu a, the variance is sigma, sigma a, okay? So it's very similar to our norm where you specify how many values you want, uh, the mean and the variance or uh, standard deviation, except here your mean is a vector and your standard deviation is a matrix or your sigma is a matrix. All right, so I, I do that. Uh, I'm going to bind them all together into one big matrix X, okay? And then on the next graph, I'm going to plot them, okay? So this is, uh, I plot all of the points here. And then, uh, and then I also draw ellipses using the, um, the ellipse uh, command, okay? And uh, yeah, you can parse through this uh, thing, and this is what it looks like, okay? So the circles represent the multivariate normal curves, which are always kind of um, conic sections, e elliptical conic sections. And so you've got, uh, well, I should just say they're ellipses, okay? So, um, so this was uh, class A, okay? Class A has a, has a mean of, uh, of two and three and variance three, zero, uh, three and one, and they're independent. Okay, they're independent and so they're, um, the major, the major and minor axes of the ellipse are perpendicular, and uh, and this is what it looks like. I'm gonna run out of time today, aren't I? Okay, and um, and this is what we have. The uh, um, here is the for class B. It's centered at zero zero, uh, and its variance uh, matrix is the identity. So its major and minor, they're they're both equal. So I don't know if there's a minor axis to this. Um, you know, you get circles, and um, which means they're perpendicular. Here we've got covariance. So the major and minor axes um, are not the major and minor. The, the major and minor axes are not parallel to the x and y axis. Okay, there's some covariance here, right? And it's centered at two negative two, and so this is where the uh, the dots are being generated from. Okay, so these are um, represent the data values that we've observed here. Um, and, and we've simulated using these, um, these things. Okay, so what's going to happen is we're going to put in a test case. We're going to say, like, here's a new test point right here, or here's a new test point right here, or right here, wherever it is, okay? And we're going to say, does it belong to class A, B, or C? Is it, should it belong to the red, the blue, or the green dot? Okay, and here's the thing, is that we won't know, we don't get to see these uh, ellipses, okay? We don't get to see the ellipses, though. we only get to see the data points. Here, I've drawn, I've overlaid, um, I've overlaid the generating distributions on top of the actual observed data. Maybe I should also, maybe I should um, hide the, uh, observed um, the generating distributions and just show you the uh, observed values as well, okay? Um, but so, you know, in our case, we know the population mean and population variance covariance matrices because we generated them ourselves or generated the data ourselves. But what we're gonna have to do is we're gonna have to pretend that we don't know these values. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna estimate what the mean is and we're gonna estimate what the variance covariance matrices are, okay? Uh, um, using the training data. So how are we going to do that? Okay, so um, we can just take uh, estimates of the mean, all right? And so, you know, the maximum likelihood estimate for the mean is simply going to be the, uh, the, the means of each column for each class, right? So we're going to take all the, we have 30 red dots here, I'm going to take the mean of x1 of the 30 red dots, and I'm going to take the mean of x2 for the 30 red dots, okay, and get some value, right? So, so I can just take my observed values and calculate the column means um, for the red dots. I do the same thing for the blue dots. I just calculate the column means, and I'm going to get an x1 and an x2. And that's basically all what this formula says, okay? It just says, take the mean of your x vectors, okay, um, and then just do it for the observations that belong to a particular class C, right? So you're going to do, um, um, for, for all the observations that belong to 
some particular class C, take the mean of that. Okay, so here I just do the column means of XA, and that's going to be this, column means of XB, and the column means of XC. So keep in mind, in the original, uh, in the distribution, the parameters were set to 2 comma 3, but because of the random sampling, we got 2.2 and 2.8. Uh, for class B, the mean values were set to 0, 0, and because of random sampling, we get something a little bit off, 0.3 and negative 0.1. And then for class C, it was 2, negative 2, and we're getting something similar, 2.25 and negative 1.9. So not quite um, exactly that. So these are just the estimates based on our observed data. Okay. All right. Uh, we can estimate the variance, okay? The maximum likelihood of uh, estimate of the variance is equal to this, all right? Uh, one over n times basically the sum of x minus mu um, squared. And, uh, but here, you know, you can just do the x minus mu matrix um, and, uh, and then you do this. Um, but that's going to end up being biased. And so the unbiased estimator of the population variance is, uh, is basically, you can call var on, uh, in R, and that's going to divide by 1, do 1 divided by n minus c. Uh, and, and, I'm sorry, 1 divided by n minus 1, OK? So we've got, it's basically the same as this, except you, know, you apply Bessel's correction, and you do 1 over uh, n minus 1 here. Okay, so we're going to just go ahead and use that for the variance. And so I'm going to take my um, matrix XA, and I'm going to just ask for the variance on XA. So if you give it uh, you know, a, a matrix here, XA is uh, 30 rows, 2 columns. Uh, I'm just going to ask for the variance there, and I get a 2 by 2 matrix. And again, in the data, when we generated the data, there was no covariance, right? The covariance we set to be zero. And again, in our random data, we're getting something close to zero, but not exactly that, right? We get something close to zero, but not exactly that. Uh, and then similarly for, um, for uh, matrix C, um, I think my variance was like three and two or something. I don't remember what it was, uh, three and three or something. And this was, you know, so our, our values are a little bit off. Okay, our values are a bit off. These are just based on the uh, randomly generated values that I have. Okay, why did I do all of this? Because all of this is going to play into um, how I estimate my, um, my likelihoods, okay? And I, I'm gonna have to continue this on Wednesday. Um, so let me just, this is the plot of the resulting um, estimated contour lines. So based this, um, so these contour lines are centered at the observed means. Okay, so we took the mean of the red dots, and the mean of the red dots is right here in the middle. The mean of the blue dots is right here. The mean of the green dots is right here. And then you can see that these are not exactly perpendicular or parallel to the x and y axes as far as the major and minor axes of these ellipses. Okay. And so these are the estimated contour lines, and you can kind of can contrast them. I don't know if you guys can see this, but you can contrast them with the actual uh, ellipses that um, uh, that were used, the kind of the normal distribution curves that were used to generate the data themselves. Okay, so these uh, the black ellipses represent the uh, the actual, and so you know as far as this one, um, the major and minor axes are parallel to the x and y axes, but then when we estimate them, um, you know, they're not parallel because we're getting just a tiny bit of covariance, right? We're just getting a tiny bit of covariance. And so, um, so they're not appearing as completely independent here, okay? Uh, and then again, this is centered not quite at zero, zero, whereas the, uh, the true generating distribution is centered over here, whereas uh, when we took random samples, we didn't get um, something perfectly centered, okay? All right, and so what we're gonna do is we have to use our estimated lines, and we're using our estimated lines, okay? And it's not really lines, we're not using the lines to gen um, estimate, but we're using the properties of our 
estimated data, which is these variance covariance matrices, and the um, the observed sample means. We're going to use that to um, um, calculate probabilities of a test case. Okay. So I'll have to continue this uh, on Wednesday, and then I'll also cover uh, naive Bayes on Wednesday. Um, uh, second quiz answer today is uh, is also B, um, B as in boy. Uh, that's the second quiz answer. And uh, yeah, and so on Wednesday we'll calculate the probability, uh, you know, the class probability of this test case. We're going to say, what's the probability that it belongs to class A? What's the probability it belongs to class B? And what's the probability it belongs to class C? OK, red, is this dot here red, blue, or green? OK, and then we'll, we'll try it out for other test cases. We're going to look at this one. Is this dot red, blue, or green? Um, what about this one? Is this red, blue, or green? Uh, what about this one? Is this one red, blue, or green? OK, we're going to test. We're, we're going to um, look through that. On uh, on Wednesday, and we'll it'll um, we'll do that. We'll also uh, expand this to the naive base case, and um, and we'll end there. Okay, uh, so that's all I've got for you guys today, and uh, so we'll see you guys on Wednesday, and um, yeah, um, we'll see you then.